go back a bit? Thank you. 
Try it. You'll have to come over.
interest in this sort of thing, only from the design industry. We've been talking to a lot of people in the video games industry, and they're interested in using some of this technology to take, say, a three-dimensional model of the character in the game and produce variants of it. You've got a little robot with a tank or something like that, and you can generate a whole set of similar sorts of things and then some 3D graphic artists having to sit there for many hundreds of hours producing similar sorts of things. A more advanced technique <coughs> is um, you could actually do this at runtime. So if, if you're playing, say, a game, every time you play it, you're going to get different things coming out of you because it's produced a different set of things and things for you to try and kill or whatever you want to do to it. So, so, so I think you get the idea.
about the morality of this. It's the worst breeding. Interbreeding, incest, murder. I mean, totally without any. any well, it's going for a couple of feminist groups, actually. Believe it or not. again everybody and it's nice to see yet again a, a, a wonderful turnout and um, first before I forget uh, this is strictly a no smoking lecture but knowing the AA no smoking means please don't smoke unless you're absolutely desperate and if you are absolutely desperate would you please go right to the very very back if you're at the front and have to smoke Move now, please. Um, otherwise, it's uh, strictly no speaking. Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to, to introduce Yasha Reichardt. Uh, uh, frequently in this series and in related lectures, we've, we've mentioned the Cybernetic Serendipity Exhibition at the ICA in, I think it was 1968. Um, this was a most extraordinary and pivotal exhibition when, for the first time ever, it wasn't just computer art thing, it was the whole idea of responsive, interactive systems were brought together. And Yashu was responsible for organizing that exhibition and producing the associated uh, special edition of uh, Studio International, and subsequently the book uh, Cybernetics, Art and Ideas. All these uh, books, I think, are well known to many people in the audience, and it's in the context of those that we've invited Yasha tonight. My conscious, of course, he's moved on from that, and I think in terms of tonight's talk's title, about artificial life and the myth of Frankenstein, some of the other books like Robots, Facts, Fiction and Prediction are possibly more relevant. But uh, actually, I think as far as I understand what she's going to talk about, and I'm sorry, I've just rushed in two moments ago to try and do this, is going to be concerned uh, with this underlying sociological and uh, romantic problems that arise uh, through the introduction of the new technology. I hope that's not too misleading. I'm sure yeah. you can it. It's an enormous pleasure to do Yasha Reichardt. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, John. That's a nice introduction. And John has just rushed back from Edinburgh to be with us this evening. Well, I'm very grateful. So anyway, I'm going to be talking about artificial life and the myth of Frankenstein. And as you all know, Frankenstein is a 19th century example, a very good example of artificial life. And since Kenneth Branagh's film was launched last November, Frankenstein has received a lot of publicity. So has Mary Shelley. Oh dear, that's right. Well, these, these were my <coughs> test slides. Sorry. <laughs> This is Mary Shelley. Anyway, she wrote that famous book at the age of 19, and that's, I think, quite, is, is quite important, nearly 200 years ago. Just to remind you of the background, in 1816, Mary Shelley and her husband, the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, together with friends, were staying on Lake Geneva. One summer evening, they were sitting at home discussing philosophy when the conversation turned to the principle of life. They decided that each of them would write a story about the issues they had talked about. In the event, it was only Mary Shelley, of the only one of the group, to write a story. And it was about a monster. Frankenstein is the name of the story. It is also the surname of Victor Frankenstein, the student who creates the monster. Since the story was written, the monster and his maker have become confused, and now many people call the monster Frankenstein. I shall do the same. I shall call the monster Frankenstein and the student Victor. Now, the main issue underlying the Frankenstein story and my talk 
is that both in the past and today, we have not really known how to treat living creatures that are not like us. At the end of March, in 1987, in an interview in the Times, the Archbishop of Canterbury complained about the general loss of what he called moral energy. Among the things he was appalled by was the way we treat the biological and zoological threats which join us to animal creation. This way of dealing with genetic material as if it were disposable waste makes for a sick society. That's what he said. The Archbishop was drawing our attention to the fact that we had launched into creating new life without thinking about what it means. Today, we approach the creation of life from several directions. This is biology and engineering, or more precisely, biotechnology and electronics, or even more precisely, genetics and neural networks. We also approach creation of life from the other end, that of media technology, through which we have brought the dead back to life and reinvented the living. Today, no new life can or should be made without a thought for the story of Frankenstein. Like stories from the Bible, it has passed into mythology. Frankenstein takes his place in the crazy cat archive with many famous figures, Mr. Machine, Mickey Mouse, and other toys. But no other toy has equal significance. Of all the stories about men's desire to create new life, the story of Frankenstein is the most emotive and tragic. Unlike the famous legend of Faust, in which the natural forces, once unleashed, are beyond human control, the fates of the young student Victor and his creation, an assemblage of human carcasses, are not without promise. It is not a story about alchemy and magic, but about science, or more precisely, about natural philosophy, chemistry, and galvanism. Although the task Victor undertakes is impossible, the fact that he calls upon science to realize his dream gives it an aura of credibility. The tragedy lies in the contradiction between Victor's rationally planned adventure and his irrational behavior. His inability to tolerate extreme ugliness may seem an insignificant human inadequacy, and yet it is the key to everything that follows. It is not so surprising that he made a hideous creature he couldn't control, but it is unacceptable that he should immediately disown it because it was loathsome to look at. Some people believe that Victor turned away from his creation because he was stunned by the enormity of his transgression. After all, the making of life was supposed to be the work of God, not of man. I prefer to believe that he was disgusted by his inadequate workmanship. No edition of Mary Shelley's book was illustrated. We have no early records of what Victor's workshop might have looked like. Perhaps it was like a British shop or an operating theater. There are no pictures of early 19th century workshops for making artificial people. Now, how am I going to get this one? I'm going to wait for the other slide to come on. No, no, it's the one before. That's it. Thank you very much. Well, these are some of the earliest pictures of workshops for making artificial people. And these are in Paris. And the year is around 1915. That is about 100 years after Mary Shelley's book. And of course, it's very unlikely that Victor's laboratory would have looked anything like this. And this is another image on the right of the same Paris workshop that you have seen already. On the other side is one of the most famous Frankenstein film sets. This one is from the 1935 film Bride of Frankenstein. Another workshop, the famous scene from Fritz Lang's 
metropolis. This is the most famous of all, I think. And here the robot is being brought to life with electricity. Victor, as a student, could never have had such equipment, obviously, although it was also electricity that brought Frankenstein to life. Now, what we must remember is that Victor is 17 when he enters the university. He is 19, that is the same age as the pregnant Mary Shelley at the time of writing the story, when he discovers the cause of generation of life and starts work on what he himself describes as the new species. The making of the monster took about 18 months, and so he is 21 on that dreary night in November that he beholds the accomplishment of his toils. From our contemporary point of view, Victor may seem young to assume the responsibility for making new species, but from Mary Shelley's perspective, he would have been a mature man. The professor whose ideas about chemistry fired Victor's imagination said in a lecture that it is the scientists studying nature in its tiniest detail that are discovering the secrets of life. No greater incentive was needed. Thought of consequences did not enter Victor's head. Consequences always seem too distant to be extrapolated and taken into account. And how otherwise should science progress? In that sense, nothing has changed, neither in science fiction nor, dare I say it, in science. Every reader of science fiction knows that respect, appreciation, and due acknowledgement are the basic requirements of man-machine interaction, whether the machine is made of metal, plastic, or like androids of proto-human parts. Hundreds of stories are based on the contravention of these essential tenets, just as detective fiction is based on the contravention of law. Without things going wrong, without travesty of an implicit contract, there would be no story. Of the prevailing preoccupations in science fiction, it is eth ethics or a sense of responsibility between the maker and his creations that stands out as the principal problem. The tragic story of Frankenstein touches on several current preoccupations. These include monsters and the travesty of what we assume to be natural laws, our attitude to automata and robots, and finally, what it means to create life artificially. Now, I start with monsters. Only a human being or a humanoid can be a true monster. No monstrous cupboard, chair, plant, or teapot could engender such fear, horror, and fascination all at once. The essential condition for a monster is that the human characteristics must not be changed too far. When departure from the norm is complete, as in caricature that is not recognizable, the result is not powerful enough to evoke either fear or disgust. These two transformations, man into frog and Elizabeth Taylor as Cleopatra into Jack Kennedy, have nothing sinister about them. Transforming a person into a monster is achieved by the exaggeration of one or two features. A line drawing of somebody's face is compared to an ideal face which represents the norm. Deviations from the norm are then exaggerated. With a slight degree of change, the drawing becomes a caricature. As the exaggeration proceeds, the likeness is lost altogether and the result is unpleasant but not frightening. It is, after all, only a flat image a drawing, and it could never be as horrific as Frankenstein himself. The difference between a computer image and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is that the first is a mechanical drawing, and the second is a fantasy painted in our imagination. Picture of Frankenstein on the left by Ewa Bremer is too mild. The only work of art that resembles the real Frankenstein from this story is Dali's soft construction with boiled beans, premonition of civil war of 1936. 
The monster is able to tap emotions of fear, disgust, or alienation. We react violently when something that we expect to be natural proves to be unnatural. 20 years ago, at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Professor Masahiro Mori made a study of the response of human beings to artificial dummies and machines. He pointed out there is a considerable degree of unpleasantness in shaking in what appears to be a normal hand, but feeling instead wax of foam rubber. Mori made a graph of unpleasant feelings provoked by encounters with the unexpected. This is not very good graph, I'm afraid, but at the positive extreme is total familiarity, and at the other extreme is strangeness. The example he gives of 100% familiarity is a normal, healthy human. The same normal, healthy human in a condition of total stillness is already at the beginning of what Mori calls the uncanny valley. This is the valley where what we know as the norm begins to be subtly subverted and where fear increases as we sink lower. It is the valley that you can see there on the, in the center of this diagram. At the entrance to the uncanny valley, we find the Bunraku puppet, a mere life-size puppet manipulated on the stage by invisible puppeteers. An artificial electric hand, which looks like a real hand, is halfway down. At the bottom of the valley is a total contravention of normality, a moving dead man. The effect of the moving dead man and of Frankenstein seem to me to belong to the same category. One difference is that Frankenstein arouses not only fear, but also violence. In Mary Shelley's book, few people meet Frankenstein face to face, but when they do, they scream, <coughs> run for their life, and Victor calls him a fiend, demon, and devil. The book gives a precise description of Frankenstein. The film images do not. Apart from having a powerful and gigantic frame, eight feet tall, no less, that could move at superhuman speed, he was not remarkable at a distance. It is Frankenstein's face of loathsome and appalling hideousness that was his misfortune. Watery dull yellow eyes, the wrinkled yellow skin scarcely covering the muscles and arteries beneath, straight black lips, all this combined with <coughs> beautiful, lustrous black hair and pearly white teeth. This is no Frankenstein from films of James Whale as played by Boris Karloff that you see here. Mary Shelley's description is far more extreme. Frankenstein's appearance combined with a hard fashion to be susceptible of love and sympathy is an equation for tragedy. He fails in all human relationships. In the novel, Frankenstein pleads with Victor for a partner, but is denied. Victor fails to complete the task of making another creature. However, in this film of 1935, Frankenstein does get a spectacular bride, played by Elsa Lanchester. He also imagined that he might find human companionship among children who would be burdened with fewer prejudices than adults. In the book, he fails in this also. On confronting images of real life travesties of normality, adults experience curiosity, fascination, and later unease. Horror is seldom felt, if only because the real giants, dwarfs, and midgets that one could have met at the turn of the century were seen at a safe distance at fairs and in exhibitions. They were presented for entertainment. The greater the departure from norm, the greater the entrance charge to see them. The term monster was gradually replaced by freak, and in turn, by prodigy. With a few exceptions, freak shows came to an end during the 1930s. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein belongs to a period when the world of popular amusement thrived on departures from the norm. These were not only more common, 
but most also more cruelly exploited. At the beginning of the century, the Barnum and Bailey Circus traveled the world with the greatest show on earth, which consisted of a large exhibition of human phenomena and nature's bizarre creations. They were bearded ladies, advertised as the consequences of unhappy love, pinheads, and other monsters which were gathered together in 1932 for a film called Freaks. This film is shown very seldom. People consider it offensive. Among the human phenomena exhibits were a girl with the skin of a leopard, Siamese twins, giants, and dwarfs, a man covered in hair top to toe, a three-legged man, a gorilla woman, and the only real and beautiful half-lady in the world, Violetta. Poised on a circular stand, she was celebrated in poems and songs. These were today's disabled, victims of nature's mistakes with occasional help from unscrupulous showmen. Some, like this man on the right, pretended to be disabled and were able to imitate many kinds of deformity. He was so accomplished in this deceit that doctors pronounced him incurable. The last of these entertainments was closed as recently as 10 years ago after public moral outcry against the manager of a New York freak show. Now many of the dwarfs are actors, busy during the Christmas pantomime season acting in Snow White and the Swever Seven Dwarfs. Human aberrations ceased to be exhibits because it was considered amoral and inhumane. The practice of creating monsters moved elsewhere, and the word monster had fallen out of use, perhaps so that we may continue to experiment unimpeded. Now I come to the next part, one kind of new life. Genetic engineering is no longer new, although it is always news. While fiction writers have toyed with the idea for decades, in the real world we have had transgenic animals for about 12 years. New animals have become an industry. A professor of law called creating life in the laboratory just scare words. A journalist called it a molecular Auschwitz. This is a new type of high yield cow. And by the same artist, Andrzej Chechot, an artificial liver for alcoholic humans. Three incidents this year demonstrate surrealist aspects of making new life that are worthy of Mary Shelley's fiction. One, a new class of genes that control a master switch in DNA molecules that tell cells whether they are to become skin bone or muscle, have been given the name of hedgehogs after the computer game character Sonic the Hedgehog. Two, a year ago, United States and Britain withdrew applications for patents on thousands of fragments of human DNA. This happened after two years of protests from researchers working on the Human Genome Project who objected to patenting anything human. Until the application was withdrawn, there were very few people in the world aware that the application had been made in the first place. Three, under the heading Frankenships, time included a mention that it is now possible to grow individual nerve cells from rats onto computer chip chips, which will lead to the development of biochips. The artist, John Kessler, responded to the discussion about genetic engineering with Martin. Martin, as he explained, is a giant tomato on an operating table that secretes ketchup through a hole. Drooling first on itself, the spittle finally ends on the floor. This was inspired by a story about genetic biologists trying to make a square tomato for easier packing and shipping. 
While the ethical debate goes on, biotechnology, whose cloning techniques date back to 1967, provides a general source of anxiety. We have seen photographs of new pigs with wrinkled skin and sheep goats. We have also seen collages of fish skeletons with human heads and cows that are half bears. It does not matter that these are just pictures, that these creatures have not been made yet. Many people believe that they will be made. Here we have a real mutated mouse and the half rabbit, half chicken sculpture that look very much alike. If it can be imagined, it can be made. There is no contradiction between an artist's fantasy and reality. They are simply years apart. How many years? Anything from 10 to 100. To the scientists, this may seem like frenzy of anxiety. To the rest of us, such future seems just round the corner. Scientists know very well that they cannot make accurate predictions. They cannot know whether transgenic crops will not become so liber liberated as to run wild. They cannot predict that genes will escape into the environment, will not but by some chance promote the vigorous development of weeds at the same time, or of some totally new creatures. Whatever doubts we may have in Victor's footsteps, we continue to experiment. Now, the next part, another kind of new life. During the 1960s, when machines were still supposed to be innocent of education, of responsibilities, and of feelings, Andy Warhol said that he would rather be a machine. Wouldn't you, he asked. He thought that it would be easier to face the world as a piece of metal. Pushing this notion further, he had a robot made in his likeness and used it to send it to dinner parties which he did not feel like attending personally. <laughs> he mused about how much better it would be if everyone were alike and generally tried to invent new ways to abdicate the responsibility of being human. Behind the banality of his nonsense were sparks of insight that would have been dismissed had they been uttered by anyone else. By making himself marginal, Warhol was free to express new ideas. We know from his diaries that he befriended television sets and married his tape recorder. He also said, if I had a good computer, I could catch up with my thoughts over the weekend if I ever got behind myself, a computer would be a very qualified boss. Andy Warhol loved plastic, any kind of artificial material, everything hygienically man-made that would not burden him with sentimental or emotional involvement. He died before neural networks came on the scene and before machines were thought of as a form of life. While genetic engineering deals with the alteration of existing material, artificial life is the creation of autonomous evolving systems. In the past, machines and living things were totally separate, but this is no longer the case. Life in the man-made variety exists in the computer, in neural networks, in cyberspace, and in various combinations. Nobody can be sure that approximations and incomplete experiments should be elevated to the status of life as we know it. Could it be just a matter of how we use words? In 1950, A.M. Turing observed that as language changes, our concepts change with it. He asked, can machines think? I believe this question to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. Nevertheless, I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. I believe further that no useful purpose is served by concealing these beliefs. That was Turing speaking. As well as thinking, 
Two other terms have come to the fore during the past 50 years, artificial life and consciousness. If we use the same language to talk about machines and humans, we risk making misleading connections. And yet, how otherwise should we deal with the words like thinking and consciousness? These words must be tested against experience, and against whose experience, if not our own. Of course, there are bound to be misunderstandings. Norbert Wiener reminds us of how emotive the problem of language can be. 200 years ago, anyone claiming that machines might one day reproduce themselves would have been disposed of by the Inquisition. The new manifestations of life hardly deserve the name of life, and yet some people, like Chris Langton of the Santa Fe Institute, think that they represent a significant beginning. Life game devised by the mathematician John Conway in the early 1960s is a prototype of life, of which many physicists, mathematicians, engineers have made variants. They all spring from the basic, deterministic, cellular automaton conceived by John von Neumann in 1940. This is a logical, self-operating, self-replicating machine. It is a machine, as Norbert Wiener explained, that generates a message that generates another machine. In its simple version, live game can be played with counters on a checkerboard that might easily extend into several rooms. It is not really a game, because once set up, there is little further to do. Players make the initial step of introducing a population of counters or cells and setting up a set of rules or a program, and then either watch the computer screen or mechanically assist in life's realization by moving the counters by hand. The outcome is determined by a set of rules applied to an initial configuration of counters which is variable. This is no, not new to you. Uh, I was here a week ago when Mike Lesser was discussing this generative process. In the original live game of John Conway in the 1960s, the specific rules were as follows. A counter with two or three neighbors survives. A counter crowded by more than three neighbors dies. A counter with only one or no neighbors dies of loneliness. An empty square with three neighboring counters gives birth to a new counter. As populations of cells appear and disappear, the evolving configurations of counters range from simple, simple figures to vast and enormously complex, stru complex structures which demand the capacity of a powerful computer to sustain their growth. Conway thought of life game as a self-reproducing animal, a weak form of life. Others believed not only that digital code can mimic life, but that cellular automata are what the world is m made of, meaning that if a computer cannot do it, nature cannot do it either. Chris Langton's cellular automata reproduce from a single organism. Gradually, the loops form a colony. Loops that are surrounded can no longer reproduce. There, the area of fossilized loops expands, so the new ones spread further and further afield. The behavior of the loops arises spontaneously. Unlike organisms, artificial life can function almost anywhere. Once the level of complexity increases, self-reproduction with more elaborate offspring can begin. It is these artificial organisms that are seen as potential inhabitants of those planets that would not sustain human life. Chris Langton believes that games like the life game can develop behavior that was not originally anticipated in the program. Two separate sets of elements with two different programs can enter into an unpredictable state of, an unpredictable state of collaboration. Such unexpected events add to the excitement of studying artificial life with cellular automata. Langton believes, in some sense, the program is a manifestation of life. He talked of his reluctance 
to turn off the computer when running a program of self-replicating loops. He also talked of the sensation of another presence in the room, and he is not the only one to regard artificial life in these terms. The field is very new. As Igor Alexander says, <coughs> it is a matter of belief. Here is Igor Alexander in the center with two of his assistants at the Royal Society exhibition. For him, man-made systems can be remade. His own neural network, Magnus, multiple automaton, general neural, neural unit system is a highly sophisticated, but it is still a program. He says, it only needs five wires for it to be downloaded into another computer. Nothing will happen if it is switched off. It is the creations of spontaneous evolution that need protection. With a computer program, it is the programmer who performs the work of evolution. Magnus is a box with mental images. Magnus lives in a virtual environment that simulates the real world as closely as possible. The environment exerts its own demands, and this is what provides stimulus or motivation, without which there would be no activity. Within it, Magnus memorizes, assembles, recalls, manipulates images and information. Its response is a subjective representation of inputs from the simulated world. In due course, Magnus will be in a position to enable a robot to look around a real environment, to memorize it, and to make use of this accumulated knowledge. Magnus has a movable window through which it can explore a picture. In this instance, that of Einstein's face. The operator gives an identification to some features of the picture with letters E for the eye and P for the pipe. Once the picture is removed, Magnus's mental state is tested. First of all, the image reproduced is just noise, but when the operator provides Magnus with letter E, the mental state recall, recalls the eye in three stages. No pictures are stored in the system. Each black dot is the firing of one of the 16,384 neurons. When Magnus is presented with the letter P, it not only finds the pipe, but recalls the trajectory of the earlier exploration, thus showing that it knows the relative positions of the eye and the pipe. <coughs> when Magnus is requested to reproduce an image corresponding to an unfamiliar letter, the result is visual chaos. There are five attributes that Alexander puts forward as necessary for consciousness in a neural net. They are learning, language, planning, attention, and inner perception. Intuitive interpretation of experience has not entered his equation yet, because nobody knows how to calculate intuition, let alone define it. Is it possible to have intuition without a body? General Edelman has developed the idea from a different direction by first giving his machine a body. He too talks about life, but uses inverted commas and distinguishes it from consciousness. Edelman's concept of mind-brain is that the brain is a system that adapts to the body's activities, editing and reinforcing good results physical or emotional, by creating stronger, relevant neural connections. A goal that is reached once can be achieved more easily the following time. His robot, Nomad, neurally organized, multiply adaptive device, lives at the Neurosciences Institute in La Jolla and is, according to Edelman, the first non-living thing capable of learning in the biological sense of the word. Nomad's brain lives in another room and communication takes place by television and radio. 
It sits on a platform with wheels and can propel itself around its environment. Instead of a program, the hardware is endowed with a preference or motivation. Nomad seeks electrical stimulation and its snout picks out magnetic blocks of different colors and sizes. Edelman believes that on the basis of perceptual machines like Nomad, there's no reason why one of their kind should not arrive at a conscious artifact. He concedes that this may take some time. Why does science take so long? Andy Warhol asked him at a party. When Edelman explained how exact everything in science had to be, Warhol sympathized. Isn't that terrible, he said. Warhol was in a hurry to join the ranks of humans under machine control. In this, he would still be an exception today. Nomad appears to behave spontaneously and can adjust to changes in its environment, but it is still at the stage of a primary school, which is maybe just as well. The uniqueness of human identity is at risk. Any progress towards the autonomy of machines makes sensitive demands on our tolerance. Can we get used to such an idea? Marvin Minsky has talked for years about the possibility of downloading the contents of our brains into the, the machine, but who will such a machine belong to? Now I come to one more kind of new life, a collage of existing parts. While thinking machines are still being educated and live in the safe precincts of universities, Everyday life has its own significant stake in the future and in the creation of new life. The idea of animating the dead has not been abandoned. When Victor made the Frankenstein monster, his raw material were corpses. He had no thought of bringing the dead back to life, but of making something new. Today we have an unprecedented choice of making something new, or nearly new, or a new version of something old. The separation of the present and the past is becoming eroded. The means of erosion include video, photographs, and sound recordings. You can record your own duet with Sinatra, you can partner Nureyev Mure on the stage, and climb Everest with Hillary and Tensing. We know all that. If it is becoming difficult to maintain our grasp of history, it is because anything that can be digitized can be re-rendered in any size and in any version. Of course, here is John Major in the company of Einstein on the cover of New Scientist, and on the other side you have Stephen Hawking in the television show, show Star Trek, once more with Einstein, who always appears everywhere, who is this time an actor. In another two years, the program will combine Hawking, Hawking, with the digital animation of Einstein that is already planned. And here is Schwarzenegger with a brand new look, and Hillary Rodham Clinton, who has joined the Marines. With such images, the concept of truth is really becoming quite irrelevant. Everyone can add to this inexhaustible evolution of mutations and hybrids. It's a new sort of zoo. The drawing by Topo on the left is in pen and ink. The still from Peter Gabriel promo has made use of the latest technology, and they have very much in common. And here you have a gender transformation by David I. Perrett and Duncan A. Rowland of the School of Psychology at St. Andrews University. Made last summer during an exhibition at the Royal Society in London, you can see precisely what sort of a process was used to make me into a man. Um, first of all, you remove lipstick. But because I wasn't wearing any lipstick, the man's lips are too pale. Uh, you make the eyes smaller, and you make the eyebrows heavier. Well, obviously, they didn't know what to do with my hair. So they just removed it. And here is another transformation by the same team. This time, 
turning the central character into a woman on the left and into an older man on the right. Morphed photographs, combinations of cartoon animation with human actors, computer animation using real people are also part of the art world and of the entertainment industry. The two overlap, of course. In the early experimental stages of these techniques, it is the artists who invent ways of putting images together. Tadanori Yoko revolutionized Japanese graphic design in the 1960s. 30 years later, he espoused the computer and incorporated in his work fragments of paintings by great artists throughout history. Here we have Correggio and Botticelli. For Yoko, these are suitable elements for a collage. But one day, some future historian will be justifiably puzzled. This sort of borrowing is part and parcel of making people and ideas immortal. We can animate Marilyn Monroe on the screen and reinvent her life, regardless of fact. We are told how to do it. In due course, her central features may find their way into a life game. It might be her smile, her voice, or her gesture. In this new form, she would become an aggregate of zeros and ones, a bit of digital code in a stock list of artificial life available to anyone with a computer. At this point, consciousness and life will once more be redefined and there is, this redefining will happen increasingly often. Our 20th century reality of Marilyn Monroe will gradually disappear. The reality that she herself was involved in will be the first to go. It probably has already gone. About a year ago, Observer published an interview with her as if she was still here, that's on the left. This has nothing to do with high technology, but it has to do with the atmosphere generated by these possibilities. Countless girls try to look like her, and future generations will not be able to tell the difference. They will know her from films that she never made, that will have been spliced together, enhanced with new songs, new leading men, and new stories. She will disappear into the collective consciousness as an icon. We know that everything can be altered by science and has or is being altered by science. This provokes many different reactions. As Igor Alexander said, how you approach the problem of artificial intelligence or neural networks or consciousness in the computer is and will be a question of belief. This unexpected possibility of immortality in a computer could fill a 19-year-old student with the same wonder, passion, and excitement that Victor felt when his professor talked about the scientist's almost unlimited powers, ability to command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. I have a couple of end notes. In September 1949, John von Neumann, who invented the atom bomb, wrote to Norbert Wiener, who invented cybernetics, the productive potentialities of the machines of the future should be kept out of the press. By now, it is too late to keep artificial life out of anything or to put a break on the thousands of experiments in progress. Even so, students playing with anything remotely resembling life whether of cells or silicon, should be advised to heed Gore Vidal's caution. There is need for empathy with others not like yourself. Vidal was talking about the land of Oz, the fabulous land where all sorts of different creatures lived in peace and harmony. The new life may or may not replace us. It is still early days. Meanwhile, I hope for two things. One, for some kind of mutual respect between the old and the new. Two, that during this relentless process of change and mutation, we shall not turn ourselves inadvertently into something completely banal. 
Thank you very much, and thank you for not smoking. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I take some questions? <laughs> I, I, I would, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to comment a little bit for my own please, spin. Please, please. Um, I, 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 18 months ago, I went to Tokyo to look at some of the world's sort of leading research on this area, and I went through some of the experiences firsthand that Yashi was describing, and they brought these back to me so strongly. Um, amongst other things, I, I went into a simultaneous translation laboratory where you speak in English and it's translated into Japanese which was very um, extraordinary. They translated it back into English to see what, how it came back, having gone through this process. And they said, then would you like to change sex? And I was translated into this voice of this Japanese girl. And it was the, one of the most extraordinary experiences to go through this uh, uh, sexual transformation of one's voice. And then, and then the, the Igor Alexander, a lot of his work, I don't really know how these were, uh, Igor Alexander spoke a number of times in the AA. He's not part of this series, but he's been very well received on previous occasions. And uh, a lot of his work on your it's being used for, for discovering um, how dense tube stations are. The cameras at the end of the tube stations are being used at the moment with these neural network programs to try to decide whether the platforms are full with the intention of, of, of regulating the tube systems with some very interesting consequences. But another aspect of this was to do with this. this I couldn't get over the pipe, the pipe oh. and the eye, because one of the ways in this which this work's been used is, is um, when you, so far, the tele telephone line cannot update a full video image for, for no. video tele fast enough, you see. So um, the, it, what they do is they update the eyes and the mouth first because that's the, that's the way you get the most information. One of the interesting things, the side twist to all this, is the way it makes you reflect back on the real world, all of this virtual world. And um, what it does is Igor's program finds the nose first. And this is already implemented in Japanese video telephone system. It finds the nose and then updates the images of the eye and mouth right, most rapidly. But of course, the Japanese, being the Japanese, have, have, have rapidly exploited um, the video telephone in terms of individual privatized video striptease. So you have the extraordinary business you ring up, you see. I, this is, I had to do strictly, of course, in the interests of scientific exploration. You dial in and, and you get this girl, and of course the problem is the television system is trying, the, the, the camera, is trying to find her nose as she strips in the middle of what it thinks is her face. And the implications of the apparent updating of the picture around this um, <laughs> boggles the imagination. And so, um, <laughs> what I find absolutely fascinating about this is that you touched on so many issues, with it, but you put this in, a, in, a, in such a beautiful, broad, cultural context, which I think has so far in the lecture series we've only been missing, and I think that was a most wonderful, if I may say mm -hmm. so, um, 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 kind of um, um, theoretical kind of uh, oh, um, um, sociological kind of exposition of the status of this. Can I encourage anyone to um, engage actually in a little dialogue about this? Chris. Um, you pointed out that Igor Alexander himself realized that whatever happens in terms of evolution happens in the computer, and if you switch it off, it's gone. So are you saying that one with somebody like his knowledge, who then goes on to study, say, uh, uh, chemistry or, or, or molecular biology, would then actually be able to combine the two and actually create artificial life, I mean, that grows by itself? You mean uh, uh, from cells? Well, from whatever, from putting a few, I mean, cells came out of molecules that sort of interacted and produced yes. energy. Yes. Well, I'm sure. I, I'm certain. I don't think, I, if it were possible for Igor Alexander to do it, I don't think he would do it. Uh, because he, he still, he still feels there's a great barrier between life and artificial life. But there are people in America who feel that there's less of a barrier. And uh, I think that as soon as ja uh, Edelman can get his nomad or new, uh, a new machine to actually feel, to have, to have some senses, then I think uh, he will say that the machine is truly conscious. 
because the definition of consciousness is not just thinking, of course, you have to feel. I mean, feeling of pain is one of the, one of the important things in a definition of consciousness. Uh, I'm speaking about something else, not consciousness, but, but growth in the sense that, you know, um, you mean, the very, very primitive forms of life actually sort of growing. I mean, they, they grew out of, um, they've evolved out of sort of complex molecules that with sunlight coming on them, which gave them energy, would sort of Oh, well, that's happening with genetic engineering all the time. I mean, that's what they do in petri dishes, so, you know. I mean, when it comes to... Oh, they, they do it all the... And uh, I think one thing that worries me about all this is that however people feel and whatever people like Archbishop <coughs> Ramsey say about these matters, it's already gone too far. These experiments have been going on for far longer than we realize. We simply don't know about it. And this is why I mentioned the, uh, I quoted uh, Wiener writing to von Neumann saying um, that um, artificial life or the possibility of creating artificial life should not be mentioned because he, he knew what is likely to happen. And, of course, this is such an exciting thing to do. Who wouldn't do it? And this is why uh, the Frankenstein myth is so important, because we have lots of victors. I mean, who wouldn't be a victor? Who doesn't want to make, make life? I mean, that could be the, the greatest thing. I, I mean, what temptation? So, this, you know, as soon as you have a chance, you do something of this sort. Have a kid. <laughs> well, yes. But if you can, can make one in a test tube or something, then maybe, you know, for some people it's even better. <laughs> well, I have to say, when last time Igor Alexander was here, <laughs> he did make the comment, we, we'd been building very complex artificial neural networks, <laughs> and he did point out that uh, the normal human reproductive system was an awful lot easier and more pleasurable process, yes. generating a great deal more intelligence and a great deal less effort. Yes. And uh, that was a nice reminder from the... Uh, Yes, he is, he is that way inclined, but... but <laughs> yes. Can we take, take any more questions? On? I, I think all of this makes us reflect so strongly upon on, on, on the nature of, 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 the, of the real exchange and experience. I think that's... Um, why do we still invite people to come and lecture in front of us? There is something about that particularity that rather than through some artificial and advanced media, which is still very, very strong in our consciousness, yeah. so which makes it worth... Did you see the posters and the tube asking people to go to the festival hall to hear live music and saying, you know, what a better experience it is? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> It's very hard to put it in words, but it's, it makes everyone reflect in that way. Well, if there are no yeah. more questions, can I thank you very much? That was, that was yes. marvelous. It made me well, start to reflect you. very much on my own. Thank uh -huh. you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was lovely. That was lovely.